for just giving us a day. Father, we set aside to sing praises to you, to lift your name up on high, just to worship you in spirit and truth. So God, be with us today as we do that. Just let your spirit move among us. Open our hearts and minds. We love you and we thank you for all the blessings you've given us. It's in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated.
Heavenly Father, we are grateful again for another Lord's Day that we can gather here as your family, Father, to a time of worship. We're especially thankful for this time as we gather around this table to remember the love that you've had for us and what it took for us to be able to be called your children. The offering of your perfect son in the place of our guilt and our, the punishment we deserve. Father, you loved us enough to provide that and Jesus willing to come to give his life for us. Just help us as we partake of these emblems this morning to, to remember that sacrifice and just help us to always be thankful for them. Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Lord, during the precious Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the many blessings Thou hast bestowed upon us. We thank Heavenly Father for this church here at Antioch and all that they do throughout the community and witness for You. We just pray, Heavenly Father, that You will continue to bless us as You always have. We ask Heavenly Father to bless the gift and the giver this morning. We just pray, Heavenly Father, for our missionaries on the foreign fields, wherever they may be. We just ask, Heavenly Father, that you keep them safe. We just ask, Heavenly Father, now forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it doesn't happen very often, but occasionally we will see a news report telling us about an airplane that has crashed. And that's always disturbing enough, because a lot of you fly often enough, or at least you fly from time to time, that when that happens, we want to know what went wrong. It's nerve-wracking enough to get in a metal tube at 30,000 feet going 500 miles per hour, but when one of those things goes down, it's, it's scary stuff. And we always see a lot of debris, a lot of carnage that are associated with a plane crash, and whenever that happens, the authorities tell us that they're looking to find out what happened by finding the what? The black box. That little indestructible black box that if they'd only made the whole plane out of that to start with, but nothing would have gone wrong in the first place. But they know that the black box has the data to tell the story, tell the history of what happened to that plane. And by looking at the black box, they learned here is what went wrong. So they look at the black box to find out what went wrong, but they also look at the black box to find out how can we prevent this from happening again in the future. And we're beginning a series today where we're going to be looking at some stories from different individuals in the Bible, and they all crashed, every one of them. Their lives had a devastating crash at some point, and we are going to discover the little black box from their lives and what caused their crash. And here's the thing. For each of these individuals, each of these instances, the black box is going to give us the same cause of the crash. We're going to see in each instance the same problem led to the carnage and it led to the crash. What led to the crash is the same thing for all of these people. It's the same thing that the black box would tell about a lot of us, myself included. Because the black box is going to tell us that the problem in each case is a problem of and that makes sense because the Bible tells us this in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. It says, first pride and then the crash. Now, most of us memorize this or we're familiar with this verse uh, in other translations which say something to the effect of pride goes before a fall. 
or fight, pride goes before a fall. And, or, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. But I love the way the message paraphrases this. First pride and then the crash. You can look at a lot of crashes that have happened. A lot of relationship crashes, a lot of marriage crashes, a lot of addiction crashes, a lot of financial crashes, a lot of emotional crashes, a lot of employment crashes. And here's the thing, when you dig up the black box in a lot of those, it'll tell you that it was a problem of pride that caused the crash. Pride is an Achilles heel for so many different people, men and women, young and old, Christian and non-Christian. So that's why I'm calling this series Achilles. As some of you know, Achilles was one of the greatest warriors in Greek mythology. But it's said that he was brought down by a single arrow to his heel. His crash came from an unprotected area of his life. And so now we use the term Achilles heel to refer to a vulnerable weak part of someone's life. And so the hope is that in this series we will be helped to avoid falling prey to this thing called pride that can be so destructive for so many. We want to address the pride in our life by seeing how devastating pride has been in the lives of other people. Because here is the tricky thing about the topic of pride. Anytime a preacher or teacher wants to study this subject or teach about this subject, there is an immediate challenge with pride. Kind of a weird thing, but I think it's true. The challenge is this. It is really hard for you and me to see the pride in you and me. And do you know why that is? It's because of the pride that is within you. And me. The pride that I have keeps me from seeing the pride that I have. It's easier for us, much easier for us, to see pride in the lives of other people. I mean, when you hear about this being taught on for four weeks, you might think, well, I'm glad we're talking about pride because my husband really needs to hear this. He always has to have things his own way. Or I'm glad we're talking about pride because my wife refuses to apologize for anything. Or I'm glad we're talking about pride because, and we think of somebody else. We don't have much trouble spotting pride in another person. We struggle, though, to see it in us. That's what makes pride so dangerous. The pride within you and me can keep us from seeing the pride that is within you and me. But we can more readily see it in other people. So I thought, let's exploit this flaw, this tendency that we have to be able to see pride in other people rather than to see it in ourselves. Let's use that flaw and study some different individuals from Scripture. The hope is that we can see pride cause their crash and maybe by osmosis or something that we will prevent it from doing the same thing to us. Now the first individual we're going to look at, we'll just look at Ezekiel chapter 28. We're going to be reading from Ezekiel chapter 28. There are really two individuals whose pride is being addressed here. We're just going to focus though on one of them. But to give, before we read this, to give you some context, context is always very important when studying Scripture, to give you context of Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel is one of a group of men in the Old Testament days that was called a prophet of God. A prophet of God was simply God's messenger. God would give a message to a man, and that man would then convey that message that God wants conveyed to a specific group or a specific individual. Ezekiel is one of these prophets, and he is a very eccentric guy. And God asks him throughout his career as a prophet to do some really weird, wild, out there kind of, kind of things. God asks Ezekiel repeatedly to do these things that I've heard called sign acts. They were acts that had a sign to them. They would be visual illustrations of the people or the person that he was prophesying to. In most instances, it was God's people, the Jews. So, for example, one time, God says to Ezekiel, I want you to lay on your side for 390 days straight. And then when that thir those 13 months were over, he had to turn over to the other side and, and be on that side for another 40 days. While he was doing that, he had to eat his bread cooked over a fire that was fueled by animal poop. I know. <laughs> I know. That's, that's exactly right. Animal poop. That's how he had to cook his, his food. There were lengthy periods of time where Ezekiel wasn't permitted to talk at all. On one occasion, God tells Ezekiel, look, your wife is going to die. 
But when that happens, Ezekiel, you are not allowed to cry or to grieve in any way whatsoever. God tells him on another occasion, you've got to shave your beard, you've got to shave your head, but he's not allowed to use an electric razor or a Harry's razor or anything like that. He's got to use a sword. And when he's done shaving with his sword, God tells him to take a third of his hair and burn it, another third of his hair and chop it up, and then another third of his hair he's to scatter into the wind. Now the most well-known sign act, the most well-known story that we associate with Ezekiel is when God tells him to go go to this massive valley and to preach. And this valley looks like something out of a horror movie because the whole valley is filled with numerous dry human bones. And God says, preach to the bones. Now I've preached at some churches that had about as captive an audience as that. <laughs> but Ezekiel starts preaching and all of a sudden he starts to hear this rattling noise from across the valley. And the noise just gets louder and louder and louder and louder. And he realizes the bones are starting to come together to form fully formed skeletons. And then they start to develop tendons and muscles and skin and organs. And now all of a sudden there's these lifeless cadavers, these lifeless corpses all over this valley. And Ezekiel is stunned. He's speechless. But then God says, preach again. And he preaches again. And all of a sudden there's this strong wind coming from all directions. And the wind goes in to the cadavers and they stand up and start breathing and they stand up like an army in unison. And God says to Ezekiel, this is a picture of my people Israel. See, at this point in history, the Jews had been overthrown. They'd been taken captive into a foreign country. They had lost their temple. They had lost their capital city of Jerusalem. Everything was in shambles. But in this story that we call the Valley of the Dry Bones, God was showing that he was going to resurrect his people in, in a sort of resurrection. He was going to bring them back to their homeland. They would rebuild the walls surrounding the city. They would, be, they would rebuild the temple in the city. They would rebuild the city of Jerusalem, and they would have hope again. So that's kind of Ezekiel's track record. That's what he, what he has to do. He's got it rough, to be honest with you. But man, this guy is faithful every time God asks him to do something. So we get to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel is told by God to prophesy against a wicked king from a wicked city of that day called, well, of this day too, called Tyre, T-I-R-E. Tyre still exists today in Lebanon. It's one of the oldest cities on the planet. But in the Old Testament, Tyre was known for its arrogance and its wickedness. Well, God issues a warning to the king of Tyre through his prophet Ezekiel in chapter 28. Look at the first two verses. The word of the Lord came to me and said, Son of man, say to the ruler of Tyre, this is what the sovereign Lord says. In the pride of your heart, you say, I am a God. I sit on the throne of a God in the heart of the seas. But you are a man. You are not a God. Though you think yourself, though you think <coughs> you are as wise as a God. Pretty simple stuff really right here. The king of Tyre is full of himself. So much so that he thinks he's a God. And God says through Ezekiel, uh-uh. No, you're the furthest thing from a God. But because of the king's arrogance, because of his pride, God says to him in verses 6 through 10 that he's going to bring an opposing army against him and he is going to be overthrown. He specifically says in verse 8 to the king of Tyre, you are going to die a violent death in the heart of the seas. And then look at verse 9. Will you then say, I am a God? In the presence of those who kill you, you will be but a man, not a God, in the hands of those who slay you. So this is God's way of humbling the king of Tyre. It's his way of cutting this proud man down to size. Well, then you get to verse 11. And something happens. Most scholars believe that this is the equivalent of what we would call a eulogy. And Ezekiel preaches this eulogy about the king of Tyre. God calls it in verse 12 a lament. A lament is simply a truth that is sad and is being communicated. In this case, it's a sad truth being communicated about the king of Tyre and how he has fallen. But when you read this, something else is going on. Look at verses 12 through 14. You were the model of perfection, 
full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz, emerald, chrysolite, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. Let's get down to verse 17. He says, your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth, and I made a spectacle of you before kings. Now, this is a difficult passage for a lot of scholars to dissect. There are varying interpretations of it. The most common interpretation is the one that I also hold, and it's this, that God is speaking about the king of Tyre through Ezekiel. Most everybody agrees with that. But God also seems to be talking to or about someone else at the same time. And this someone else is the individual who's really calling the shots in the king of Tyre's life. This individual is the devil. It's Satan. Satan has so warped the king of Tyre, and he's led him to become this epitome of evil. And so Ezekiel prophesies against the king of Tyre. On the human level, that's what we see. We see a human prophet speaking against, prophesying against a human king. That's what we see in our natural world. But there is a parallel world to our natural world that is spiritual. So what is happening in that spiritual realm, in that world that we cannot see, is that the God of the universe is prophesying against this once beautiful angel who was called Lucifer. So starting in verse 11, a prophet is talking about a king. That's the realm we see. In the spiritual realm, I think God is talking specifically to and about Satan. I think we can safely assume this. Because Ezekiel says here, you were in Eden. Well, the king of Tyre was not in Eden. Who was? Satan. This king is corrupt because Satan has allowed him to do that. Because this king is corrupt because uh, the king of Tyre has allowed him to be. Ezekiel goes on to say, when he was in Eden, he says, you were this magnificent creature. He refers to him as a guardian cherub. And Cherub is a form, a type of angel that we read about in Scripture. But at some point, he became full of himself. God says your heart became what? Your heart became proud. So he was thrown to the earth as a punishment. This is, I think, the most specific biblical instance of the very first sin ever committed. It was a sin committed by a holy angel named Lucifer, and the sin was pride. Now, the first human sin is obvious, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. But I think it's safe to say that Lucifer's sin was the first in this spiritual realm, and it was a sin of pride. The first sin was pride. Now, C.S. Lewis would later call... Pride, the source of every single sin. Here's how he wrote it. He said, there's one vice of which no man in the world is free. A vice which everyone in the world loathes when they see it in someone else. And which there are hardly any people who ever imagine that they are guilty of it themselves. He says, this is pride. Now, Isaiah chapter 14 is kind of a parallel passage to Ezekiel 28. We read this in Isaiah chapter 14. It says, How far, how you are, how you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You've been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most. High. Kind of the same thing happening here. This is a prophet of God, like Ezekiel. His name is Isaiah. And he is speaking against a wicked human king from the country of Babylon. And it seems that God is speaking both to the king and the one who's really controlling him, which is Satan. Notice how many times he says, I will. I will ascend. I will preside. I will climb to the highest heaven. This king is a pawn of Satan, and he's full of pride, and everything he's thinking of is what I will do. So what we have here, I think, with pride, is this the first sin. It comes from Satan. 
Satan's pride led to his literal fall, and he lost his place in heaven. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before fall. First pride, then the crash. When we find the black box from this wreckage, it tells us pride caused everything. <coughs> now here is what we hate to admit. We don't want to own up to this. It's hard to come to grips with this. But we regularly follow Satan in this very same path. This path of pride is primarily evidenced when an individual says, I'm going to decide for myself. I'm going to be God myself. I'm going to call my shots. I'm going to go my way. And Satan knows that this appeals to us because in his very first temptation of a human being, this is what he said to Eve in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. He says, God knows when, the, when you eat of the fruit that you've been told not to eat of, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Like God. Knowing good and evil. You will be like God. You and I hear that temptation every single day of our lives. Satan whispers that into our ears every single day. Why listen to God? Why let Him tell you what you can do and can't do? You have everything you need to make decisions for yourself. You see, for all of us, Every day is like a trip to the Garden of Eden and there is a snake there and he is waiting for us and we have to make the choice. Will I worship God and find my true place in this universe or will I worship me and decide that I have a better plan than the creator of this universe? I would venture to guess that this is a temptation that you and I face every single day of our lives multiple times per day. But again, we struggle to see this in ourselves. But there are some telltale symptoms of pride. There really are. Here are some symptoms that we do, in fact, struggle with wanting self to be God rather than God to be God. One symptom is that of arrogance. I'm always right. My way is the best way. When I'm my own God, I don't listen to the wisdom of other people. When was the last time you made one of the following statements? I was wrong. You were right. I should have listened to you. I like your idea better. Even when you don't realize it, there can be such arrogance present within us. And it's a symptom of pride. Insecurity is another symptom of pride. Hear me out. When I make me the center of everything, I am consumed with what other people think about me. And I'm terrified of being seen as a failure. I become so self-conscious because when I'm my own God, everything becomes about me. We become overly focused on what we're wearing or something. We're worried about how our children behave in public, not because there's a right and a wrong way for children to behave, but because if they behave the wrong way, it's going to be a poor reflection on us. And I'm, I'm my own God, and so that's, I don't want that to happen. We frequently fret over whether we're presentable, whether our house is presentable or not. There's just this constant concern over how other people perceive me. It's because we have become the God our lives. We're concerned about how other people see and evaluate and perceive me. It's insecurity. It's a symptom of pride. <laughs> Defensiveness is a symptom of pride. You ever find yourself taking the slightest suggestion, the blandest criticism, the tiniest piece of advice as a personal attack? What makes you that way? But when you've made yourself your God, you've got to be perfect. Nobody else can possibly be in a position to elevate themselves to a position over <coughs> you where they are right and you might not be. Defensiveness is a symptom of pride. 
Here's a big one. Criticism. When you are the most important being in your life, that means what you like and what you prefer takes precedent over what everybody else likes and prefers and all their ideas. It makes you have an opinion about everyone. And you share that opinion with everyone. You're quick to tell people this is wrong. Or you tell someone else what someone else has done. So somebody might do repair work or they might do a renovation, but you would have done it this way and it would have been better. And you never think that your way may not be the best way. <coughs> there, there could be another way of doing something. But that never occurs to you because you were the most important person to you. I think maybe the biggest symptom of pride is simply discontentment. If your needs and if your desires rule the day, then it's not going to sit well with you when someone else's spouse is more romantic than yours, or when someone else's spouse is more attractive than yours, or there was a party or a group of people went out to eat and you were not included and you wonder why did they forget me? A friend posted something on Facebook and got 250 likes, but your flowery narcissistic post about your kids only got 150 likes and you wonder how can I get as many as that? It makes you jealous when somebody else succeeds. It makes you envious when you're not included. It makes me bitter when I don't measure up. It makes me resentful when I'm not recognized. It makes me suspicious when I, I don't get what somebody else did. Pride makes me discontent because my desires are number one. Just think about, put the verse back up there again, Norbert, from Ezekiel 28. The way that Lucifer, the way that Satan is described, read what God says to Satan through Ezekiel again. Look again at Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 14. He says, you were the model of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Ruby, topaz, emerald, chrysolite, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you, God says. But he says your heart became proud on account of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth, made you a spectacle, made a spectacle of you before kings. Do a checklist here that describes what Satan, what Lucifer was like before he fell. God says you were the model of perfection. No flaws. You were full of wisdom. He didn't need to seek counsel of other people because he was full of wisdom. You were perfect in beauty, he says. He didn't have to wake up in the morning and spend two hours in front of a mirror getting ready. You were perfect in beauty, God says. He was adorned with all these precious stones, some of whom I probably pronounce wrong. I don't even know what they are. But they, they communicate that he had tremendous physical beauty and value. He also says you were a guardian cherub. So he had an important rank. He was not just another angel. He was an angelic higher up. And then God says, that's what I ordained you to be. I looked up that word ordained in the Hebrew language, the original Hebrew language of the Old Testament. It's the word nathan. It's, it's spelled Nathan, but it's pronounced nathan. But it carries the idea of bestowing something onto someone. The, a picture of this for us would be like a serviceman or servicewoman being honored with the uh, Purple Heart or the um, Medal of Honor. That's, that's the idea here. You're being bestowed with this honor. That's what it means when God says, that's what I ordained you to be, for so I ordained you. And yet, he has all this prestige, he has all this glory, and it's not enough. All this glamour that God bestows upon him, it goes to his head and he becomes proud. And he's not content with the much that he has. He's not content with his wisdom. He's not content with his beauty. He's not content with his perfection and value. It's not enough. He says, I'm not content and I want more. So he says, I'm doing it my way. I can do better. So this created being, Satan, knows better 
than the one who created it. And in his pride, he falls. Pride goes before a destru destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. First pride, then the crash. Now I could give you dozens of things that we could do to make sure that we choose God over self every single day. I'm just going to give you one of them. It's the most important. One thing we need to do is this. To combat pride, we must have an accurate view of self and an accurate view of God. What it means is we need to be put in our place. Now we hear that and I think of that as being something negative, right? And truth be told, when somebody says, Evan, I'm going to put you in your place, that doesn't sound very appealing. That's usually something we say when there's a confrontation that's going to happen and, and the one in authority is going to provide a reality, reality check to the one who is under that person's authority. And there's that word, authority. We don't like it. That's the problem with pride. Pride is an authority issue. And if you struggle with authority, men going to struggle with pride. Satan's gripe with God was that he didn't want to be under God's authority. The problem with that, though, is this very glaring, basic reality that Satan is created and God is creator. And as the created, he falls under the authority of the creator, whether he wants to or not. Whether he wants to submit to that or not. It's just how things are. When you are created. And he is creator. So rather than go on some lengthy exposition on how we can do this. I think the best way we can learn and catch this. Is to see it in the life of another individual. Other than Jesus. Who did this really, really well. If we're gonna if we're gonna learn the negative by looking at the individual Satan, then I think we can learn the positive by looking at a completely different individual. So that's how we're gonna finish this up. Do you remember when Jesus first came onto the scene and began his ministry as a public figure? At that time, there was a guy. Jesus is thirty years old at this time. At that time, there was a man in a similar line of work that Jesus was getting ready to involve himself in preaching and teaching. And this guy was really popular. He also happened to be a relative of Jesus. His name was John the Baptist. His name was John, but they called him the baptizer because that's what John did. He would preach these powerful sermons about God's kingdom. He would challenge people to repent and turn away from their sins. And he would talk about how the Messiah was getting ready to come. And he would tell people, you need to repent of your sins. And then he would baptize them for repentance. And people loved listening to John. He had this very different appearance. He had these bold convictions. He was not afraid to tell the truth. And people flocked to him for, to the Jordan River where he did most of his preaching. And he did all of this stuff. He did all of this preaching, all of this baptizing, because this was what God had put him on the planet for. God had commissioned him for this specific task. You preach, you baptize, and you prepare people for the coming of my son, for his ministry. So the things John taught was going to prepare people for what Jesus would teach and his message of truth. So John is told by God, prepare the way for my son. And John does this job beautifully. Then Jesus starts ministering. John even baptizes him reluctantly. And Jesus starts teaching, traveling and teaching, and he implements this very unique, innovative style of teaching called storytelling or parables. And the Bible says the people heard Jesus teach. They, they received his teaching well because he taught like someone who had authority. He taught like he knew what he was talking about and like he had the authority to speak on it. In addition to that, Jesus is performing miracles. And this is all wonderful, great news. But here's the problem, if you're looking at this from a prideful human perspective. Someone in John the Baptist's shoes 
would see that the crowds that once flocked to him have now gone to Jesus. The crowd that once came from all over to hear him preach are now traveling even further to go and see and hear Jesus. And it appears from a human perspective that John's 15 minutes of fame are up. And guess what? John's 15 minutes of fame were up. Now John has his own disciples, just like Jesus will later have disciples. They come to John one day and they say, John, we got terrible news. Everybody's flocking to Jesus. The crowds that came to you are now with him and you don't have the audience and the influence you used to. What do you want us to do about this? What do you think should happen? And John's response is incredible. John says, good. That's good. Specifically, he says, Jesus must increase. I must <coughs> decrease. More him, less me. That is having an accurate view of yourself. That is having an accurate view of God, of Jesus. That's why there is no trace whatsoever of pride within John the Baptist. And it's no wonder that Jesus would later say of John the Baptist, he is the greatest man ever been born. John's greatness came about because he knew his role. He had an accurate view of himself. And he had an accurate view of Jesus. And he lived his life out of that reality. He lived his life out with that humility. Now here's the truth you need to know about you today. The accurate view of you and the accurate view of me is that we are all created. And we are all sinners. And we all are incapable of saving ourselves from that sin. But the accurate view of Jesus is that he is the creator and he is sinless and he can save us from our sins through his death and resurrection. <coughs> so your responsibility in light of this truth is to accept Jesus humbly as your Lord and as your Savior. This morning we're going to sing a song of invitation to give you that opportunity to say, more Jesus, less me, for you to surrender yourself to him in humility right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day and for this time of worship. Thank you for this story that we've studied today, the origin of our enemy, and how we can learn from him, and how we can see that we have followed him in this path of pride that we have all traveled at some point. Father, we thank you that you teach us through your word and also through guys like John the Baptist, how to prevent that pride from becoming a hindrance. For us to have an accurate view of who we are and to not have an accurate view of who you are. We are created. You're the creator. We are sinful. Jesus is sinless. We cannot save ourselves, but Jesus can save us. And if there's somebody here this morning that needs to be saved, they need to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, I pray during this song of invitation that they would humbly walk forward, confess their faith and their trust in your Son and in His saving power, that they would make the decision to repent of their sins and say, I'm turning away from a life where I call the shots and I'm turning toward a life where you call the shots. And then to be baptized, Father, to be buried with your Son, and to be raised, a new, raised as a new being, to be born again. 
Father, we thank you so much that that opportunity is always available to us. And as we sing this song now, Father, for someone that needs to seize that opportunity, I pray that they would do so. We thank you so much for your son, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our song of invitation. How alone is the
Lord, we are need you for my survival.